Hey everyone, Crow back again, and this is Home Computer Heroes Collection 1, a collection of seven rather recent indie games that were released for older computers, including the Commodore 64, Commodore Amiga, and MSX2. As with every Evercade collection, what's included with the cartridge is a clamshell case and a full color manual, but also included as a bonus is a mini comic featuring the prologue for The Sword of Iana, which is one of the games included. And also, I got a Steam code for Farming Simulator 17, which is on Steam. And I'm not sure if all copies will include this, and it wasn't really advertised that this would be included either. Now, I played all seven games included in the order in which they were originally released, and those games are Tanks Furry, which is a multiplayer tank game for the Amiga, Planet X2, a real-time strategy game for the Commodore 64, The Sword of Iana, an action platformer for the MX2, Farming Simulator C64 Edition, and the title of this tells you exactly what it is, Bridge Strike, an action game for the Amiga, Attack of the Petski Robots, an action strategy game for the Amiga, and Citadel Remonstered, which is a first-person shooter game, also for the Amiga. Now, I played all these games on my Evercade VS with my Mayflash F500 arcade stick, except for one, and I'll talk about that later. Now, as usual, I'll talk a little bit about these games, starting with my least favorite. All right, first up is Planet X2, released in 2017 for the Commodore 64 by David Murray, who may be better known as the 8-bit guy on YouTube. And I've known about Planet X2 even before it was announced for the Evercade because I'm subbed to his channel. And this is part of a series of real-time strategy games, which started with Planet X1 for the Commodore VIC-20, then came this game, Planet X2 for the Commodore 64, then there was Planet X3 for MS-DOS, and most recently, as of December of 2023, Planet X16 for the Commander X16. And if you're like me and you're like, well, what the hell's the Commander X16? Well, it's basically a retro computer the 8-bit guy created in 2023, built with modern, off-the-shelf parts. And I'm not going to go into any more detail about it other than that, because that's literally all I know about it. Now, the story for Planet X2 is quite simple. Humans discover Planet X2 and begin preparing for colonization. However, upon arriving, they find the planet is also being claimed by an alien race called the Protoids, who begin to thwart the humans' colonization efforts. And the result of this is this real-time strategy game. You choose from one of 13 maps, choose a difficulty level, and then begin the game. You start with a factory and two builders, which you can use to bulldoze things on the map, carry items, and build things like walls, bridges, and other structures like solar panels, refineries, missile silos, and more factories. Now, the factories are important because you can use them to build more builders, build tanks which can drive around or be parked in sentry mode, or process minerals for more resources. Now, over time, you'll begin to be attacked by the protoid scouts, and the only way to win is to locate all the protoid pyramids and destroy them all. However, if all of your factories are destroyed, then you'll lose the game. Now, I'm not really the right person to be talking about this game, and that's because I'm not a huge fan of real-time strategy games. I'm terrible at them, and every time I try, it just ends badly for me. And to be honest, I really wasn't looking forward to playing this one. I made an effort, and I found this isn't a terribly complicated game, and I got a pretty good idea of what I needed to do and how to do it. I played three games on three different maps on easy mode, but I got utterly destroyed by the protoids each and every time I played, though I will say that I kept surviving longer and longer each time I did play. But I gotta say that after about an hour or so, I just really wanted to play something else. Anything else. And I know it's not because the game is bad, it's just that I'm so terrible at games of this genre, it's to the point where I don't like playing them. But putting that all aside, I'll say that extra effort actually was put into this arcade version of the game to make it more playable on a device without a keyboard. As an example of this, the game will actually refer to the Evercade controller buttons when giving you options as to what you want to do with your units. Also, if you want to pull up the virtual keyboard, it'll pull up a modified version that'll only show you 10 keys that you would need to press to switch to different units. 
That being said though, you do wind up having to use a lot of buttons on the controller and there aren't even enough buttons on the controller for all the game options you'll encounter. So sometimes you'll need to press two buttons to select certain things. And I'm personally really slow to react in these type of games but I found myself proceeding extra slow in this one as I often sat there really thinking about the buttons I needed to push for the thing I wanted. And despite the updates they made for this game to play on the Evercade, the game still probably plays a lot better on a keyboard than with a controller. Now I was thinking about giving this game a five out of 10, even though I don't like playing it because I could at least understand the game. And if I had more patience for these type of games, who knows, maybe I'd grow to like it but I'm knocking it down a notch to four out of 10 because of the issues I had playing with a controller. Next is Farming Simulator C64 Edition. This was developed by Christian Ammon, co-founder and CEO of Giant Software, which is the same company that does all the other Farming Simulator games. Now, this was originally announced on April 1st, 2018 as an April Fool's joke. And you can still see that trailer on YouTube and the link will be in the description below. But then they went ahead and created it anyway as a bonus pack-in for Farming Simulator 19 Collector's Edition. But then after that, they decided to go ahead and make it available for anybody that wanted to purchase it, including going as far as to create a limited physical cartridge run of 500 units. And you can still buy this game digitally on the Farming Simulator website for around $5 US. Now there's really no story to this at all. This is just a really oversimplified version of the farming simulator games. And when you start to look into it, the game may seem to be complicated, but it's actually really simple. You can select your vehicle by pressing one of four buttons. You've got the red tractor with a plow, the green tractor with a cedar, the blue tractor with a trailer, and the green harvester. What you have to do is actually really simple. You take the red tractor with the plow and you plow the dirt. Then you take the green tractor and seed the plowed dirt. And if you're out of seeds, you take the tractor to the silo to buy more. After that, the crops will grow pretty quickly. Then you take the green harvester and run it over the crops to harvest the crops until that unit's at its capacity. Then you take the blue tractor, drive it to the harvester to transfer the crops from the harvester. And then when the blue tractor is full, you drive it to the silo to empty the crops and you earn money. And that's basically the whole game. Once you harvest the crops, you plow the dirt and just repeat the whole process again and again and again. Now there's actually two conditions that could lead to a game over. The first is if one of your vehicles runs out of gas. So you just have to make sure to keep an eye on how much gas your vehicle has. And if you're running low, just drive it to the gas station and fill it up before you run out. The other way the game can end is if you run out of money. And that can only happen if you're buying gas or buying seeds. If you leave the vehicle parked there too long and the money drains down to zero, bam, game over. Now, before I actually played this game myself, I decided to check out Farming Simulator 17 on Steam with the code that was included with this collection. And I did this because I never actually played a Farming Simulator game before. And hey, the game code was included, so why not? And man, within five minutes, I could tell that this was not the game for me. It was getting pretty in depth with the details, and I really don't have an interest in farming for real. So it wasn't too long before I started trying to cause as much havoc as I could and the game just doesn't let you. All I wound up doing to make the game a little bit interesting was dump all my farm equipment in the water and then I shut the game off. So my expectations of the C64 version of Farming Simulator weren't the best. However, this extremely simplified version of the game didn't bother me too much. In fact, I kind of liked it. It's just something you can play without putting too much thought into it. Yeah, you can screw up and get a game over, but you really have to not be paying any sort of attention for that to happen. When the game boots up, there's no instructions or tutorials or anything. It's just, here's a field and some equipment, go at it. But without any instructions and just knowing what the buttons did was enough for me to figure the game out in about five or 10 minutes. Now there are a couple issues with the game. And the first is that your game will only show two vehicles on the screen at the same time the one you're driving, and the one you last drove. So if you want to use the tractor with the trailer to pick up the crops from the harvester, the harvester had better be the last vehicle you had selected, otherwise you're not going to find it. But you know what? It's hardly an issue. It's just a minor nuisance at best because after you use the harvester, the next vehicle you're going to want to use is the tractor trailer anyway. 
Now, the other issue I found was with bumping into other items on the map, especially when you're driving the tractor trailer. It can be difficult just to keep vehicles on paths at times, and I found myself just hitting trees or signs or fences or whatever else might get in my way. And when that happens, you just kind of stop and you're forced to back up very slowly and try and wiggle your way to get past the thing you bumped into. Again, just kind of a minor nuisance and something that happens less frequently the more you play the game. And ultimately, I'll say that the game's okay. It's simple and straightforward, almost to the point to where it can get boring. Actually, you know what? I take that back. The game will get boring, but I think it's fine if you want to play something while also having the TV on or listening to music or something. This game really doesn't require your full attention. Now, I was really on the fence of giving this a 5 out of 10, but ultimately, I kind of think I do like it, so I'll give it a 6 out of 10. Bridge Strike is next on the list, and it was originally released in 2019 by Project Red. Now, the version included here is the Amiga version, but it was also released on iOS, Android, and on the Nintendo Switch. Now, I think the Amiga version was created first because at a glance, the iOS, Android, and Switch versions all seem to have game elements that were added that aren't in this Amiga version. And the most obvious thing I noticed is that there are coins to collect in those versions. But since this is the Amiga version and I actually didn't play the other versions, that's what I'm obviously going to be talking about here. Now, the game has an intro sequence that kind of tells you what the story is, and that's that some distant country has mobilized its military forces and has started to advance towards your territory. It's up to you to take your jet fighter and stop them. Now, as soon as I saw this game, I suspected that this would be a graphically updated version of Activision's River Raid, and I was totally right. Your jet can speed up, slow down, move left and right. The fire button will release missiles, but you can only have one set of missiles on the screen at any one time. And just about anything you come into contact with will destroy your jet in one hit. Except for the aircraft carriers with the F on them, which will refuel your jet when you fly over them. And it's important to do that every so often because you're constantly losing fuel as you fly, or you can still destroy them for some points. Now there are a couple differences between this and River Raid besides the graphics, obviously. And the first is that there are destructible rocks in this game that you'll sometimes need to destroy in order to fly past them. And the second is that this game actually does have an ending, complete with an epilogue and everything. Now, I like River Raid, so I was curious if this would be a better upgraded version of that. And in some respects, yeah, but I gotta say, I like River Raid more overall. I like the look of the game and the graphic design, and everything has a lot of detail, and occasionally you'll see something on the screen that'll reference something, like these sandworms you may notice later in the game. However, I think the graphics are part of the reason the game feels harder than it should, and it's primarily due to the silos that'll launch missiles across the screen. They can easily get lost with everything else going on in the background, and if you don't notice them before they launch the missile, you may get hit by them before you realize it. And the other thing is that the game's music is very grating on the ears after a while. The same few chords get repeated so often that I nearly quit playing after about 40 minutes because of it. And another thing I haven't mentioned, but I'm sure it's fairly obvious from the video footage, but when you fire missiles, they don't just go straight ahead. They're steerable. So if you fire a missile and move left, the path of the missiles move left as well. Now I know River Raid had steerable missiles like this, but here, I think I would have preferred if the missiles just kept going straight ahead after you fired them. And I think it's because your missiles move slower here than they did in River Raid, and that makes all the difference. Now, I'd say those things are pretty big issues, but it's not enough for me to say I don't like the game. However, I'll say that River Raid is still a much more enjoyable game to play than this. I'll give this one a 6 out of 10. Halfway through, we have Citadel Remonstered, and this game has an unusual backstory. With the popularity of Doom in the early 90s, it was thought that a first-person shooter like that wouldn't have been possible on the Amiga. So four teenagers from Poland worked on creating a game like that for about a year, and the end result was Citadel, and it was released in 1995, and people were amazed that the game could even be run on a base-level Amiga 500. Now, there's a whole story about how the publisher of the game, Arrakis Software, screwed over to developers and never paid them. But that's a whole other story, and I'd recommend searching for that story because it is kind of interesting. But fast forward to 2022, 
and two of the game's original developers released an upgraded and tweaked version of the game called Citadel Remonstered, which actually improves the game's graphics and performance, as well as tweaking the actual gameplay to make it a bit more fair to the player. So the game's story is that you are the only survivor left of a space expedition that was meant to investigate this citadel, which I think is supposed to be an intergalactic prison or something. Uh, basically, it's all about killing everything you see and maybe finding pieces of a bomb to blow the whole thing up. Now, the game plays very much like Doom. There's different guns to pick up, doors are locked that require you to find key cards, and there are switches littered around each level that need to be activated in order to be able to advance to the next level. Now, what's crazy about this game is that I played it, wrote what I thought about it, and then discovered a tiny little detail in the manual about the controls, and then had to go back and play it again and completely changed my mind about it. So the footage of the game you've been watching is not how I originally played this game. Here's what the game looked like when I originally played it. And this is the only game in the collection I didn't use an arcade stick with. I originally used my 8-bit though SM30 Pro because a gamepad would obviously be better to play this game with since you could use the shoulder buttons for strafing. But for some reason, I just wasn't comfortable using that controller with this game. And the small screen size didn't really help things, but this is how the game looks with the default settings. Or maybe close to it. In the options menu, you could change the screen size from 1 to 5, and I was playing with it set to 5, and the default might actually be 4. In case you're curious, here's what it looks like when it's set to 1. But I originally missed the note in the controls that said if you double tap the B button, it switches to a full screen mode, and that is so much more preferable. So I wonder, why isn't this an option in the menu? Furthermore, why isn't this the default setting? You might think that the performance tanks in full screen mode, but I didn't really notice anything like that. Also, when I went back to play this game again, I decided to use the Evercade VS controller instead, and I gotta say that was way more comfortable for me to use with this game. So with those details out of the way, I'll say that I'm not really sure they were trying to create a game like Doom. I mean, it's not really like Doom at all in the end. It's not fast-paced, there's no music to get y'all pumped up, you don't even see the weapon you're carrying on screen. Now, I've only played three levels, but that's only because it takes forever to finish levels. It's really easy to get lost, and I wound up pulling up the map a lot. And one thing to mention about the map is it doesn't tell you which way you're facing. But you have a compass on your main screen, so you wind up having to remember which way you're facing before you pull up the map. A lot of areas are only accessible through teleporters, and while teleporters are marked on the map, there are often quite a few of them on each level, and it doesn't tell you which one goes where. There are also an overabundance of switches in each level, which will lock and unlock doors, but sometimes you don't know if you're locking or unlocking doors, or even which doors in the level you're affecting, and unless you know exactly what you're doing, you're going to be running around in circles, and you're not going to remember which switches you've already flipped. But those are only a few ways this game is cruel to new players. Right from the first level, you'll have to remember the correct path to take, oh because you don't start with any weapons or ammo, and in the first room you enter, you get a pistol and some ammo, and then the path splits, left or right. If you go left, well, you're kinda screwed, because you'll have to encounter some enemies, and you more than likely won't have enough ammo to kill everything you encounter. But if you go right, you'll get more than enough ammo. Another thing I saw that was kinda messed up while I was in the first level, was that I hit a switch on the wall, and it caused a teleporter to appear right in front of me. Oh cool, I must be on the right track, I thought. So I entered it, and I was teleported into a room so full of monsters, there was no way I could have survived. Ha <laughs> ha, joke's on me, I guess. So I initially wanted to give this game a 4 out of 10. Then I figured out the full screen thing, and then I played with a more comfortable controller for about 3 more hours, and kinda got used to the game's shenanigans. And trust me, there's more I didn't even touch on, like the alcohol you'll sometimes be forced to pick up that'll get you instantly drunk, making it hard to walk and shoot anything. But at the same time, I was still kind of enjoying the game and making progress, so I guess I don't hate the game. I guess I gotta give it a 6 out of 10. Tanks Furry was originally released in 2016 for the Commodore Amiga by Project Red, 
these are the same people that did Bridge Strike. Tank's Furry is a top-down pink battle game that seems to be heavily influenced by the Famicom game Battle City. The story is that an army of moles is attacking a peaceful city intending to completely level every building and enslave its residents. Fortunately, Captain James McHound and Lieutenant Theon Greywolf quickly appear to drive back the invading force. The controls are really simple. The tank moves in the direction you move your controller, and there's a single fire button. And there are two game modes. First is the multiplayer mode in which you can play with up to four players where you fight each other in multiple rounds. And I didn't really play this mode. I just kind of checked it out briefly. The main mode I played is the campaign mode, and this is for one or two players. There are 42 levels, and the objectives are to protect your radar because if your radar is destroyed, it's game over. Don't lose all your lives because that's obviously game over. And destroy all the enemies, and they'll appear up to four or five at a time. And then once all the enemies are destroyed, you'll move on to the next level. The game features destructible environments, some terrain that can't be navigated, and power-ups will occasionally appear, which can do things like increase your shooting speed, increase your movement speed, there's a bomb that'll destroy all the tanks on the screen, there's a skull that'll destroy your tank, and actually I guess that's not really a power-up, so you should really avoid that one. There's another one that'll freeze all the enemies in place for a while. There's temporary invincibility. You can get an extra life. There's another one that'll teleport you to a random location. And then sometimes you'll see a nuke and collecting that will just instantly end the level. Another thing I noticed were these people that were jumping up and down. And I thought originally that those were people that needed to be rescued. But when I looked it up in the manual, it turns out that those are in fact our prisoners. And it turns out if you collect three in a level, you get an extra life. Now, when I first started playing, I wasn't sure if I was liking the game or not. The action was pretty slow, and I thought it was pretty weird that the enemy tanks were moving around and shooting completely at random. If they shot you or destroyed your tank, it was really just dumb luck. But the further I got into the game, the more I found I was actually enjoying it. You've got to really strategize for the fact that all the enemies just move around completely at random, and you just try to minimize the chance that their tanks are going to get a clear shot on your radar. But yeah, it's still not the greatest game, but it's certainly not bad. And I'm sure the multiplayer mode would be fun with a group of people, though that's only available if you play on an Evercade VS. So in the end, I'm going to give this one a 7 out of 10. The Sword of Iana was originally released in 2017 by Retroworks. And by the way, I'm not 100% sure I'm saying that correctly, but that's the way the name of the game looks like it should be pronounced. So you'll just have to forgive me if I'm saying the name of the game incorrectly. Now this game was released for the Spectrum, Amstrad, and MSX2. Now I think that the Spectrum version was the first to be released, and this here is the MSX2 version, and this happens to be the very first MSX2 game to appear on the Evercade. But if you go to Retroworks website, the ROMs for all versions of the game can be downloaded for free. The story is that long ago, the goddess Ayana had chosen a warrior named Tukaram to wield a sacred sword that could defeat the Lord of Chaos. He was successful, but centuries later, evil has returned, so now it's up to Tukaram's descendant, Jarkum to find the Sacred Sword and defeat evil once again. Now this is a platformer, much like Prince of Persia in a way, and the fighting kind of feels like it too. As you play, there are two states your character can be in. The first is the exploration state, and in this mode he can run, he can jump, he can pick up items, and this also means that you have an inventory of items that can hold keys, health potions, and weapons. But when you encounter enemies, you have to kind of go into this fighting mode. And in this mode, you pull out your weapon and you can only face in one direction. And it, you don't have to worry about enemies approaching you from both sides at the same time because you really only fight one enemy at a time in this game. And while you're in this fighting mode, you can block or you can attack in different ways. And the way you attack depends on which way you're pushing the joystick as you're pushing the attack button. Now, I was actually quite impressed by this game. Most of the time, it felt like a fluid platformer, despite the limitations of the MSX2. I mean, there's not a whole lot in the way of animation frames, and the game certainly can look stiff and jerky at times, but the gameplay feels so good that it doesn't seem to matter most of the time while you're playing. The only time it really feels awkward are the few instances where you have to jump on moving blocks, 
and that doesn't really play so nice. And for some reason, your character's jumping straight up animation is just really weird and it just looks like something is wrong. Other than that, this game had a few surprises I was not expecting. The combat is pretty straightforward, like I'd mentioned, but what I didn't realize until the last level of the game was that you could pull off combo attacks if you push the joystick in different directions as you're attacking. And that made the combat so much more fun for me than it had been up to that point. The other thing that really surprised me is that you build experience for each enemy you defeat, and you defeat enough of them, you level up and you become stronger. And then there are other hidden weapons throughout the game that you could find, such as an eclipse and an axe. Moreover, I was not expecting each level to continue on the game's narrative on your quest to defeat the evil. For example, when you first start the game, you journey to a location to discover what you need to do. Then you find out you have to visit your ancestor's tomb, and then you hear from his spirit. After that, you discover that he broke the Sword of Iana into four pieces, so you'll need to go find them all and have the sword reassembled. But in order to do that, you have to undergo a trial from the goddess to see if you're worthy enough to wield the sword. And when you do get to equip that sword, although the game doesn't play different, you still feel accomplished that you managed to assemble the sword and wield it for yourself in the last level of the game. I really like this one, though I couldn't help but feel that this game could have been so much more cooler if it was made for more modern platforms. Ah well, maybe in the future. This is going to get an 8 out of 10. And my favorite game in the collection is Attack of the Petski Robots, and this version was released in 2021 for the Commodore 64 by David Murray. Yes, another game from the 8-bit guy. This is an action strategy game that started life on the Commodore Pet. And Petski actually refers to the character set built in the Commodore Pet. It was then ported to the Commodore 64, the Commodore VIC-20, and then many other platforms after that. Now, the 8-bit guy didn't do all of these ports. In fact, the version included here is the Amiga version, and that wasn't ported by him. Now the game's story is that a bunch of human settlements have been taken over by robots and it's your job to eliminate them all. There are 12 scenarios and 3 difficulty levels, and there are 3 types of robots you can encounter. There's the hoverbot, which can float over water and some other objects, and he won't attack you unless you attack first, unless you're playing on the most difficult mode. The second robot is called the rollerbot, and this is a more powerful robot and he will shoot you if you're in its direct line of fire. And then the third and most powerful robot is called the Evil Bot. And while he can't shoot you, he will always try to take the most direct path to you, and he can deal massive damage if he comes into contact with you, usually killing you in one or two hits. Now what you'll do is you'll move around each map with the ability to search and move objects. You can collect key cards which can open locked doors, med kits which can heal yourself, magnets that can be used for disrupting the robots, time bombs which can cause an explosion a few seconds after they're placed, an EMP that can freeze all the robots on screen for a few seconds, and there are two types of guns you can pick up. The most common is the pistol, which is really weak but it has plenty of ammo, and the plasma gun, which is really powerful and has a huge blast radius which can easily damage you if you're too close to the explosion. The goal of each level is to destroy all the robots through any means necessary and then find a teleporter to exit the level. So, like usual, before I played this game, I looked up some information on it and then I just jumped in. The first thing that threw me off was that my character was just jumping from one square to the next. And I know that there are games that lock you to a grid-based system, but it kind of threw me off that there was no movement animation in between those spots on the grid. But then I realized that this is because this is a more graphically updated version of the Commodore Pet version, like all versions of this game are. And it's something I got used to, it's just not something I was expecting at first. As I played this game, I kind of figured a few things out. Eventually I looked in the Evercade manual for details on how some of the items work, and eventually I was able to beat the first scenario. Then I started playing the second scenario and I was eventually killed and I thought I had a pretty good grasp on the game. I was going to give it a 6 out of 10 and I even created the gameplay video that I would be posting on my Crow Capture channel. Then I thought to myself, I wonder what the Commodore 64 version of this game is like. So I searched for it on YouTube and then somehow came across the 8-bit guy's video on how to play the game and he was doing it on the very same Amiga version. 
I watched a portion of the video and realized I had been playing the game wrong. And it was mostly because I had a misunderstanding of how important it was to move the items around and the properties they had along with how the robots would react. I had thought that with the weakest robots, I had to shoot them as fast as possible before they did any significant damage to me. And if I did take too much damage, well, that's why there were medkits there for me to find. It never occurred to me that I could move a chair or a box in between me and the robot and I could shoot the robot over the object and it couldn't hurt me at all. It also never occurred to me that if I used an EMP blast while the robot was over the water, it would fall in the water and then be destroyed. And it also never occurred to me that those green cylinders would explode if I shot them. So watching that video showed me there was more interactivity with the environment that I had thought. I thought the only reason you could move stuff was because sometimes items would be in your way, not realizing that you could utilize them in creative ways for eliminating robots safely without taking any damage. So I scrapped all the footage I had recorded and played again and completed the first three scenarios on easy without much issue and I was having a blast. But while I was playing, I was still kind of having an issue with the gun. If you just press the fire button, you don't shoot. You still have to press a direction to shoot along with the fire button. At first I didn't get it because how do I shoot without moving then? Then I realized you have to hold the fire button down first and then tap in the direction you wanted to fire for it to work as intended. And then I was like, oh, it makes so much more sense now. So yeah, I found the game really fun to play in the end. I still kind of think that pressing the fire button in the direction you're already facing would have been a better way to implement that, but maybe there's something with that where it wouldn't work well in certain situations that I'm just not aware of. Also, if you want to move an object, it can kind of feel awkward because in order to move one item multiple spots, you have to press the move button, point in the direction of the item you want to move, then move in the direction you want to move the item, and then move yourself to line up with the object again and repeat the process over and over and over again until you've moved the object where you want it. I feel like there should have been a better way of moving things, but regardless, going back and giving this one a second shot made me like this game a whole lot more than I originally did, and I'll gladly give it a 9 out of 10 here. So now it's time to rank Home Computer Heroes Collection 1 against all the other Evercade collections I've looked at so far. But before we get on with the ranking, you may notice that I've made some adjustments on this ranking list. Now it didn't change the ranking order of the collections, but I've slightly adjusted my criteria for each of these rankings so these cards would be more evenly distributed and that's just something I think I may want to do every once in a while. Basically, what it boils down to now is that in order to get a D or higher, I would have to give at least one game in the collection an 8 out of 10 or higher. And that may seem kind of extreme, but these are supposed to be curated game collections, so why load these cartridges up with bad or mediocre games, right? Anyway, before I had played Home Computer Heroes Collection 1, I really had no idea what was going to wind up even after I'd played some of these games and graded them. I went back and played them again and I actually changed my mind on a few and that may have bumped it up a little bit more than I had originally placed it. So it's going to fit in right here on the C plus rank right under Galco Arcade 2 and above Pico Interactive Collection 3. And that's going to wrap it up for Home Computer Heroes Collection 1. The next collection I'm going to be looking at is Duke Nukem Collection 1, one that I've been looking forward to for quite some time. Uh, really, just because of Duke Nukem 1 and 2 Remastered being on here, I'm more interested in playing that than Duke Nukem 3D Total Meltdown. Now, originally when they kind of teased and announced this tr uh, this collection, I was really excited because I thought we were getting the uh, DOS version, MS-DOS version of Duke Nukem 3D. That's what it kind of looked like they were going to do when they did the trailer. And then I found out, oh, this is going to be the PlayStation 1 version. And uh, it, it, I don't know how I'm going to feel about this one, to be honest, because I love Duke Nukem 3D, but I played it on PC. I'm used to playing it with a mouse and a keyboard. That's how I played it. And uh, going to the PlayStation version, I'm going to have to use a controller. And I'm, I'm just not really fond of playing first-person shooters with controllers. Sometimes it seems to work, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so 
yeah, I really don't know what that's going to be like. So uh, we'll find out in the next video. All right. See you next time. Bye.